Hey, hey, here with Easy Jeezy. Corona or no Corona, I need a burrito, by golly. I haven't had a burrito in a couple weeks. So well, let's get right into it here, and I gotta quit shouting. We gotta take a step backwards here, and I want to, we really gotta wrap our heads around what we're trying to do with these Weber carburetors. We're trying to mix 14 pounds of air and one pound of fuel to get a perfect stichiometric mixture that will burn completely. They use a term called volumetric efficiency. When a car, a carbureted, normally aspirated carbureted car leaves the factory, it's running at about a 70% volumetric efficiency. When we start hot rodding these cars and making them to higher performance cars that you can really feel an improvement as far as performance, we're moving up to about 75% volumetric efficiency. We're improving the volumetric efficiency in a narrower power band than when it left the factory. A Formula One car can become 99% efficient, but it's in an extremely narrow power band, and I don't want to go into a lot of details on that sort of stuff. It's just important that you wrap your head right now around that 14 pounds of air and one pound of fuel to go through this carburetor. This is a precise instrument. It will work on a lot of different Volkswagen engines, <laughs> okay? During the 60s, people were racing Volkswagen, air-cooled Volkswagen engines, and they were, they were taking any kind of carburetor they could from any manufacturer and bolting them on these things and taking them to the track and trying to run these things down a quarter mile and they came up with a lot of ingenious things. One of the most popular carburetors during that time for street driven cars and off-road cars was the Zenith 32 NDIX carburetor that Porsche had put on the 356 engine. That was like the one to have. That was a very tunable carburetor but you really had to know what you're doing to get that baby dialed in. Along came the 70s, and even though Volkswagen had produced a dual port head earlier in the 60s, they finally put it into all their engines, their mass produced engines in the early 70s. It was at that time that CB Performance, Claude's Buggies, uh, and Bob Tomlinson that's when they decided, okay, they're going to get a, a package, a kit, for people to bolt onto their cars. And it was the Weber. It was the 40 IDF Weber carburetor. And if you bought a package, or if you go to a swap meet, and you see an older carburetor set, that's probably where it came from. Because... Uh, <clears throat> And the way they set those up, they came straight from, they came delivered a 40 IDF dual throat Weber meant to be put on as two carburetors, dual carburetors, four barrels, port on port, came with 28 millimeter Venturis, a 55 idle jet, a 50 pump jet, a 115 main jet, an F11 emulsion tube and a 2.00 air correction jet. Now you could bolt that pair of carburetors on any Volkswagen engine with a 69 millimeter crankshaft and it would probably start and run. Then it's up to you to start tuning it. And that's what this series of videos is going to be on. There's a lot of people that are making videos and show videos of rebuilding their carburetor, changing gaskets, cleaning them out, things like that. But what I'm striving to do in this series is really explain 
how this thing functions so that when you do have issues with your carburetor you know what to look for and if it has a certain operating characteristic that you want to change you'll know what part of it to go to the chain there's no sense guessing and there's no sense just copycatting what you think that your friend's car car's got in it and please 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 whoever you are whatever you are myself included I'm guilty of this as well when you get the jet drills out and you start drilling out jets, please, please, please rub off the original factory number that was on the side of that jet. Somehow get rid of it. Scratch through it. Make an X through it. If you want to rewrite it on the side, whatever. But don't just send these things down the road with the stock number on the side after you've put a drill through it, okay? That would help us out. I don't care if you're putting solder back in them, filling them up and re-drilling them. You keep going with bigger drill bits and soldering them up and then re-drilling them until you find the one you want. It, it, just make it clear what that thing is, okay? It will save a lot of us a lot of trouble. So, that was the magic combination. So, I know there's a lot of you people that you go to a swap meet and you know you don't you just see that 40 IDF and you think yeah I'm gonna take these home and it's gonna work today you're gonna pay anywhere from six seven eight hundred dollars for the complete carburation setup and that's just part of it because you may need to replace your distributor you're probably for sure gonna need to add a fuel pump regulator these carburetors have a, a, a needle and seat for the float they can just just adequately handle three psi maybe three and a half but that's the book says three and a half but three three pounds per square inch it, and a stock uh, Volkswagen fuel pump is capable of putting out more than that you you want to have that thing dead on the nuts and for me personally to get rid of some of the clutter in the engine compartment I personally like to go with a low pressure aftermarket rotary fuel pump. They have the faucet pumps that they click a little bit and you, depending on how you have them mounted, either one of them depending on how you have them mounted, you may hear them. The ideal place to mount it is underneath the gas tank and push that fuel back to the back of the car. This whole thing is, can be kind of a dangerous situation. Uh, because if you do get in an accident and something happens and the key is still on and the engine is not running it's still going to be pumping fuel if the carburetors are tilted to the side you could be looking at a serious fire hazard there and it's something to keep in mind um, there's different ways to address that you can use uh, a relay it gets too complicated you can use a fuel pressure switch so if you not the fuel pressure, the oil pressure switch, you could come up with a circuit so that if you lose oil pressure, it automatically shuts the fuel pump off. I had a factory modification done to that on a Chevrolet truck. It was brand new. It kept vapor locking. It was one of the early S10 trucks and the factory did that and the problem with having that electric fuel pump would not come on until it did see fuel pressure so every time you started it you had to crank that thing for a long time before the fuel pressure came up I resolved that issue myself by putting a spring-loaded override switch in parallel with their switch so that I could prime it and get it to start because it was fuel injected it was that throttle body fuel injection it was, ah, that was a horrible vehicle horrible vehicle excuse me I hope this is just an allergy I've been trying to get up this video and my nose just won't stop running and now I'm forced to stay inside as well so okay let's uh, let's change positions here and let's keep going in more detail so that you can uh, understand what's happening inside this carburetor and get yours dialed in or decide whether or not you even want to bother with this. Okay, let's get a little visualization going here. 
This is a Solex PIC30-3. It was designed for a smaller displacement engine than a 1600. Now, if you look at it side by side, I think it's very visible even with the camera. This was a 34 PIC4. PIC3? PIC4. Jesus criminy. What do we got here? PIC3. Okay. But the point that we want to make here is that you see this is feeding four cylinders. And this one's feeding four cylinders. Okay? And so when they increase the displacement, the, you know, they're still shooting for that psychometric fuel ratio as best they can when it leaves the factory. But I want you to notice that there's a little hole in the butterfly plate on both of these. They completely close that butterfly. Europeans did things a little bit different than on American cars. They control that airflow. This was the the hole was a, a constant velocity, uh, not velocity, I don't want to get you misled with that word even though it's true. It allowed a certain amount of air to get by and then you could tune it. It was very precise tuning because they were dealing with emissions over here and they're dealing with an economy car. Now what you're doing is taking the same engine that this ran for and what are you doing over here? Look at the difference in the size. You know you're doing it times four and you think that that might be overkill but with this particular carburetor you have the ability to crank up that engine to 6,000 rpm and get the flow doesn't mean it's going to do that but you have the capability of moving that much air that's the whole point of this right now if you increase the displacement more you look inside this one over here. This is a 44 IDF Weber. It's 44 millimeters across the bore opening here. And it's 40 across here on the inside diameter. Okay? So this is what we're doing here. And it, it might think that it would be a simple thing to just take one of these carburetors and put it in the middle. That's not so simple because this carburetor was designed originally to run port on port. Now if you had a smaller engine like a 1500 cc and you put dual port heads on it and you wanted to run that Solex carburetor, the bigger carburetor, they make an adapter plate that will allow you to do that. You'll note that it moves it further away from the generator alternator, so you have clearance on that side, but it allows you to run a bigger carburetor, but you've got to neck it down and adapt it. It will flow more fuel. It'll extend your RPM range just a little bit. It might give you a little bit of uh, acceleration improvement and you probably will notice it with your seat of the pants meter okay you're gonna note when you look at the carburetor these are your main jet stacks I'm gonna go into a lot of detail on those but for now let's get the top of this carburetor off you have a uh, there is a filter screen in the side of that it's probably still a good idea to run another separate filter before it goes in there you're still going to get debris that goes into your carburetor and uh, it's going to be annoying but that's life that's the way it is we gave you the sizes already now I want you to note this slot that's in the middle here right here this slot this is the vent this is where dirt and debris gets into your idle jet okay that's where it's coming in from it comes in through your filter it falls down here and it goes into your jet you've got all these fuel filters it's probably not coming in with your fuel 
if these carburetors sit with fuel in them until it all evaporates and sits that way for years, then you get this uh, deposits. Gasoline is a blend of things and you'll get this varnishy deposit that will coat the inside of the passages. It seems like that stuff will break loose just a little at a time from the heat, from the vibration, and just the solvent effect of the new fuels going in. And remember that today's fuels aren't the same as they were many years ago. They've done a lot of things different to them to make them work better and cleaner for modern engines. Now, when it comes time to take this top up, you want to be extremely careful. The gasket is between the float and this top plate. So if it sticks to the base, you want to have a sharp knife or something to release that if your intention is to reuse that gasket. And probably when you buy these things for the first time, you'll you just want to get them on your car and see if they'll work. I mean, before you, you might order a, a master rebuild kit with uh, new gaskets and so forth, but I know you're going to be excited and you're just going to want to hear what the car sounds like if it sounds any different than it did before. So, this is what you could expect to see on an older carburetor when you take it apart and you look inside. And it ain't pretty, let me tell you right now. Isn't that nasty? Look at all of that stuff in there. That white stuff is oxidation. It's from water that was left inside there. It came in with the previous fuel. The fuel evaporated away. Maybe it sat outdoors and it, and it kept getting more water in there. I did not know that when I bought these carburetors. And they still work with that. I have tried soaking them. I have tried cleaning them and getting in there with little brass brushes and different things. They still work, but it sure is a disgusting thing to see and it's it's uh, something that you need to look out for. When you go to a swap meet, generally carburetors, Weber carburetors, and these the, car, the Solex carburetors are going to be right up front where you can fondle them. But usually those Webers are going to be back out of reach because every guy that comes by is going to want to pick those things up and jerk on the throttle and do those types of things and it is annoying as hell for the seller. But generally as a rule, unless you lay the cash down on the table, they're not going to let you take those things apart. They're just, you're, you're buying it on a wish and a prayer. You're much better off buying these things new. And the HPMX uh, copycat carburetors, you know, they do a pretty good job of, of, re, of remaking these darn things. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I know people that have them, and they didn't have any problems with it, but they are more experienced people and they know how to set them up and those are some of the things that we're going to cover and why we're making this video Ugh. this nose of mine is just killing me now anytime you get a set of these carburetors one or more carburetors before you put them into use you the first thing that you really want to do is check that float level now okay tilt it towards you now the idea is to get the valve closed and you want from the bottom of the gasket you want 10 millimeters to the top of the float and that is basically level so look to the left and look at the valve that's going up and down it's hard for me to see it moves and then it kind of stops that's when the valve is closed it still moves up farther but the valve is actually closed where you see that springiness come into. That spring tension is there to make up for vibration and bumps in the road and that type of a thing. So if you want, you could, to get a feel for it, you could stick a piece of uh, clean fuel line onto the nozzle, stick it in your mouth, and you could blow through it and you could hear that air stop when you get to the correct spot. Now, I just took this one of these carburetors, I have the, the other one, the other 40, on that single setup. 
that's a whole different animal and I've talked about it before made a video about it and we'll cover that again later but uh, what I did was I leveled it out over there on that car it has electric fuel pump and I I turned it on and I filled up the carburetor with the top on and I had the float level what I thought was right if you get that correctly and you remove the carburetor with that fuel in it or refill it somehow like I just described please be safe and be careful if you're using raw gasoline at all times what I found now the floats themselves are going to displace fuel but when you lift the top off if you don't spill anything the correct fuel level from the edge of the top surface here is going to be 10 millimeters okay exactly 10 no more no less now a little a little secret here I'll share with you you can raise that float level a millimeter and you can that's the same thing as putting a bigger main jet in there you could lower it a millimeter and that would be the same as putting a smaller main jet in there it gives you a way to check out after you've driven your car what direction you want to go and you say to yourself boy that's a lot of work if I've got it in the car and then I have to take it apart, take the top off, go through all of that just to do that. Well, the other option is to uh, get more main jets. You know, it comes with a 115. You might want to order them uh, and get a 120. I don't really think that you'd want to go with less than a 115, but it depends on where you live. I'm at 5,000 feet. Uh, there's less air up here, so this 115 works pretty good right out of the box. I had used the proper size screwdriver. The bigger the screwdriver, the better it fits. Pretend like you're a gunsmith and try to fill up the whole slot with whatever screwdriver you got. Yeah, they're big and they're long, and you don't want to get carried away when you're tightening things down, but it helps you with your alignment when the screwdriver is longer. And this stuff is brass and you don't want to screw it up okay on this particular one now this one's different than the 44 and this this stuff isn't interchangeable and these do come actually do come in different sizes but the thing I want you to see here that's important is that this float area the float bowl think of it like a toilet there's always water sitting in your toilet and you also have to have a vent on the roof of your house for that thing to flush light right and work smoothly and that vent although you can't see through it here I told you this was this was the vent to the float bowl in order to prevent fuel from sloshing out of these things on the off-road ones they have a little aluminum wedge that you can pound down in there and it has a smaller hole that sticks up higher and if you try to look through there right now you won't be able to see through there because the other end of that hole is offset and is on this side of the the slot so don't be chopping holes in the gasket saying that it doesn't go through and that's where your problem is and so on and so forth but you do have to have air available to that and that's where it gets it from right here on the sides okay so now we're gonna take um, now the reason I'm talking about that I'm loosening up a lock nut and a little grub screw on this side of the carburetor okay and that will allow us to lift out the venturi okay venturi the gentleman venturi was also from the uh italian heritage and 
he lived and he died in 1822. Mr. Weber was born in 1889 and lived to about 1945. So he was using uh, physics that this guy Venturi, the reason why they named these things after him, is he's the, he's the one that was sitting by the river one day and saw when the river narrowed, the water had to speed up. And then if the river widened again, it slowed back down. And we're doing this thing. I want you to think, don't think of air as being a thin nothingness. Think of it as a weighted object. So, just like water. Think of it, it, it has a weight of 14.7 pounds at sea level, and that would be known as one atmosphere. That's kind of irrelevant, just, just some terminology because I just read it in the book. It's still fresh in my mind. It would never come up in normal conversation, but I'm just trying to give you some, some, some of the general information because it's, it's all very interesting. Now, uh, the, f the water in the bowl, the water, <laughs> I got a one-track mind, the fuel, the gasoline that's in the bowl, the height of that is critical. That's why it's important right off the bat to set that float height right because it can throw all of your other measurements and the whole system it can throw it off and it, it'll make it feel one way when it not indeed it's not that way even if if you have a Baja and you got those 33 inch tall tires on the back and it's leaning forward and down that puts these carburetors at a, a little bit of an angle and it puts you at a disadvantage right there as far as setting your float level but you know how often are you on dead level surfaces on the highway there's a little bit of slop built into this thing but just the same that hole on the side above the Venturi that goes in this auxiliary Venturi, you can see where it enters right here. It That low pressure area created up here at higher speeds when you have enough air going through here to influence it, that's when it starts drawing fuel from the float chamber, the main well in this jet stack. That fuel is metered by the main jet which goes right there on the end of the stack. It comes in from the bottom. It comes out again into this well. This little well is it's going to equalize. When your engine's not running and it's shut off, that fuel level is going to equalize. It's going to come up here and whatever level that is sitting in here, the float level, that's where it's going to stand. If your needle valve on your float is not adjusted right, or if it's uh, worn out, fuel could come out and down into your intake manifold and create problems if it if there's enough of it where it got into the combustion chamber it'll wash away the oil and it, that that creates wear and tear and a problem so now you've got the this is sitting down inside the well you're metering that main flow into that area and you're this is creating a situation to draw that let's put this back in here the reason I took this out is I wanted you to see how easy it does come out. There's a little dimple on the back and there's a grub screw on this side. If you are really of the... This is made to for, for allow your engine a stock 1600 or a 1915 or a 2 liter. I have run this carburetor on a 2110 and it was economical and it was fun to drive. It just would no longer go to 6000 RPM. Your 1600 dual port, you put a pair of these carburetors on it and you're in a situation where 
you have the capability of providing enough fuel to go 5,500, 6,000 RPM and get better economy than the stock carburetor and intake manifold that, that it came with on the car, provided you have a, a smooth path for the air and fuel to go. You're allowing it to come in, you have a combustion chamber design that it's going to move it out. You have a camshaft profile. You have your ignition at the right time. And you have a free-flowing enough exhaust to evacuate the waste gas. Then all this comes into play. But even if all of those things aren't perfect, this should go on your car and run your car. If you are a serious racer and wanted to put this on... Uh, you wanted to run bigger Venturis, I suppose you could go 30 or 32, but I would never go bigger on the Venturi than that. You would want to go bigger with the carburetor body like this 44. The 44 normally came with 36 millimeter Venturis. You can purchase 32 millimeter Venturis and put in that 44 and that way it will idle and run like a normal car but on the weekend when you want to go to the drag strip and you want to go for max RPM you would change your jets change your Venturis you don't have to buy the whole carburetor setup and you could do it I I don't know if I'd want to do it on the car <laughs> And on a dune buggy, yeah, uh, but in a regular sedan, you probably have to take the darn thing off. So, you know, again, if you want one vehicle that can do everything, it's a lot more expense and a lot more work. And racing is work, one way or the other, right? Okay, so let's just say that, and you'll note that it's not 40 millimeters across the top on the bottom. It is down here, but not at the top. So just uh, just letting you know. So now you got your Venturi in. Now we're going to put the auxiliary Venturi in on the top. And this is all is a snug tight fit. Okay, so you got that in, in there. So when enough air goes through here, it's going to start pulling fuel. through the jet stack and out into the airstream and it's going to atomize it. it you really want to atomize that. The liquid fuel does not burn. It's the individual droplets and the vapor around it. So the finer you can make those droplets, which is called atomizing, that's what this is doing and this is what it's helping. You've got air that comes down from the top remember our example about the toilet in the house and the roof vent on the roof well that's kind of what we're creating right here you've got this uh, orifice on the top which you can change the size of so the air is coming when the, when the fuel is being drawn out it's also drawing air from the top that air is coming out these holes over here and it's making a bubbly atomized hopefully misty foam so it's not just pure liquid that's coming out you're giving it a head start and you're trying to atomize it in here now just think f11 don't mess with these unless you have the type of measuring instruments that can uh, measure at the tailpipe you're probably not going to feel it so much in the seat of the pants although when you're fine tuning for certain characteristics in certain situations then you can start maybe think about messing with those I purchased a, a uh, F7 and an F8 emulsion tube for my center mount project in the hopes of getting more fuel to come in there earlier there's several things going on here there's the number of holes and there's the diameter of the tube in relationship to the size of the well because it can create more fuel in there and more fuel can get drawn out quicker and then the overall main the re you're replacing that fuel 
Everything's got to go through that main jet. These things rarely, if ever, get clogged up. I mean, you got to have some pretty bad habits if you get these things clogged up. I've never had one in 30 years get clogged up. I'll tell you that right now. So this screws down and holds it all together. This top piece here, this is just universal. It doesn't come in different sizes. It's just basically holding your main jet stack. And that's what we call this is the jet stack because you're stacking up different orifices there. So if it came from, let's say the factory with the 28 millimeter Venturi and the 115 main jet and the point or 2.00, air correction jet what's left in order to get this thing to work right you've got your uh, idle jet which is right here and with you anytime you get popping and snapping out the exhaust pipe that's generally means a lean condition and that idle jet is found right here this is these things are small these are what gets clogged up all the time the fuel comes through the point, the end of the jet, and then it comes out on the side. It mixes with air. That air comes from this hole right here. This is not a replaceable item. The factory realizes that the butterfly is closed when you're running on the idle circuit, or almost closed. And so this is where this does the same thing as that emulsion tube for the idle circuit. It mixes the air and fuel and then it if you just look at the 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 webbing here, if you look at the the where they drill the circuits through, you can see everything that's happening. You can see the uh, accelerator pump and how it pushes up here and it goes through where did we lay that? We laid it down right here. Your accelerator pump jet. And on this particular brand, you have you can get these different nozzles in different sizes. You can get them larger or smaller. You can change the stroke length for the amount of fuel that you're pushing in by turning this nut in and out if you need a richer mixture. If you're in a situation where you are snapping that thing open and it's got that stumble to it and you have a center mount carburetor then you have the this is a check valve is called the uh, bypass screw <laughs> where did it go did it stick on my screwdriver I lost it no oh, there it is okay okay this is the this is a check valve when you push on your throttle and that accelerator pump instead of it squirting out here at the top if there's a delay or if you push slowly it won't come out there that's intentional that's to avoid you running over rich and and but there are times you know if you're really getting with the program and you're up around 2500 and you hammer it and you need that rich extra squirt of fuel that's what these ex the accelerator pump and these jets are supposed to squirt down in there and give you that extra rich mixture along with pulling it in from the fuel well and coming in through the progressive circuits which we're, we're coming to here shortly but you can get what they call a zero bypass valve and that is just designed so that it would make fuel come out of your accelerator pump jets sooner quicker it'd be more sensitive it's not as a fuel efficient if you put one of these carburetors on in a center mount position it's not going to be as efficient as it is with two of them and that might not make sense to you but that's a fact because of that intake runner that intake manifold you got to have a lot of heat in there you're dumping a lot of raw fuel in there and the reason that you see a lot of the center mount single carburetors on race engines is usually in the Baja. 
the Baja 1500, whatever, those Baja race cars. It's hot temperatures, it's a hot climate, and those guys are racing. Hello, they're not sitting idling in traffic all the time. They are racing, they're going fast, and they need those types of things. And with these carburetors bouncing around all the time, you're in an over rich condition anyhow. These things aren't gonna perform, don't expect better than 20 miles to the gallon at best with these carburetors if you just run one of them in a center mount position. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. We'll make a separate video for that later. So, we've got our idle circuit. We've got our main fuel circuit. We've got our float level. We've got different accelerator pump jets. And this comes all ready to go. So why are you so many people having problems with it? Well, it's for the same problem that if you watched my 34 pick 3 quick fix, you'll note that you use this linkage to adjust the throttle speed of your engine. You use the the little screw is the fuel screw, the big one is the air screw. And that's what's going to control the speed of your idle to get that idle RPM zeroed right down. On this one, you access the main jet through this screw here, and the idle jet is over here on this side. But when you're tuning it, when you're adjusting the idle and you've got everything else perfect, it's this that you use for the air, for the air screw. Now, on this carburetor, because those butterflies are so huge, you, if you hit the throttle hard, <laughs> you're doing so much more. This, this is four, this is going to four cylinders, right? This one's going to one cylinder. So that when you when you bang that throttle and open this baby up, holy moly, that is just uh, that's insane how much air that you're dumping down in there, right? Okay, so if you look when you do open it, the brass nozzle is where the needle valve is that controls your fuel. This is a long needle. Most of them come with short needles. The earlier ones came with short needles. And those, you could only turn them like a quarter of a turn. Was It'd make a huge difference no matter how much you turn those. On these, you start with them farther out, one and a half, two turns, and they you can turn them more and they're not quite as sensitive. Now, these progression holes. What you want to do when you get this carburetor is you want to make sure that the tip in, this is what we call tip in, when, when those throttle butterflies just start to open, that's what's known as tip in. Okay, so when it's at rest and you're trying to get the idle, when you set these things up, it's best just to set that throttle stop and get it right where it covers that first hole. You're going to adjust the fan speed. There is leakage right now around these butterflies. You can check it with a feeler gauge. You can put like a three or four thousand feeler gauge in there and preset them with that. But the idea is if you have those, that's an unmetered hole. These progression holes, that first, that, there's four of them there. And those are unmetered in the sense that you don't have control of them with a, with a needle like you do with this one. It's, as soon as that butterfly opens past those things, it's sucking fuel. It is fuel that comes from the idle circuit. And that volume of fuel is going to be controlled by the idle jet which should be laying here on the table. Where did you go? Do-da, do-da. Somebody see it? There it is right here. Okay, your engine, all the fuel that your engine runs on at idle comes through that little tiny hole. 
50 and 55. 55s is what uh, seems like I end up with. And uh, you, depending on the size of your engine, you may have to go a lot bigger. Um, the main jet is usually controlled by the size of that Venturi. The formula to figure that out is whatever the Venturi size is times four is what you should, that number will be the uh, main jet. That's how they arrived at that 115. Uh, it's a lot easier to go with, uh, the th uh, if they were 30 millimeter Venturis, you'd multiply that times four, a 120, maybe even bigger, 125 main jet. Never bother in between. Now, somebody's going to ask me, what size is an idle jet? And I took time ahead of, ahead of time here. That's right, now I remember. I've got 16 thousandths of an inch for a 50, and I've got 5 thousandths more of that for a 55. I got 20 thousandths, 15 and 20 thousandths on an idle jet. So just use those numbers, do the math, and uh, check out your 115. Actually, I don't have any 115s. I can't find the damn things. Can you believe that? I need four of them and they're missing. I have them all in a bag and I can't find that bag. And I wanted to make this video. This is another thing that's been costing me time here and putzing around. Let's take a quick look on this side. You're going to notice a difference on the carburetors. This has got a manual choke. This one has a block off plate. You may need to add the block off plate uh, for sanitary purposes. These were used carburetors. You can see where somebody boogered up the screws and had to use washers underneath here. Um, I'm telling you, it's just amazing what you get. That is dumping extra fuel down these circuits. It's a totally different circuit and that uh, choked fuel will come in through these holes right here. The gasket's going to come over it, but it's going to splash in there. It's a manual choke, okay? It, it is a manual deal. Okay, so now, uh, what else did I want to show you? Uh, okay, yep, 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 we're not done yet. We're not done yet. Uh, these little screws here on the inside, this is to hook a, uh, in the old days they used to hook a mercury column to that. They had a, a gauge, uh, it was four tubes with equal length hoses and you put them to each one of these in an idle and you could synchronize your carburetors at an idle when they were on the idle stop by using that uh, gauge. You check, watch your tack, watch your RPM, get it to idle down, and you synchronize it. And once you get these things synchronized with this screw right here, that's the end of it. You're never supposed to ever touch those things again for any reason whatsoever. Now, these uh, screws right here, these are bypass screws. It just goes from above the butterfly to below the butterfly. And it is a metered screw. Let me see if I can get one of these things out for you. They should be closed, like I said. But I've seen some guys, and I've experimented with those. That's not meant to set your idle by. If uh, <laughs> if you got to move this butterfly, woohoo! Come on out of there, baby. Okay. You can notice that it also is at a needle. And you never want to tighten this stuff down really, really tight. You just want to close it. And then you want to count your turns open. It's critical that all four of these be exactly the same. The real intent of these uh, needles for this idle bypass, air bypass screw, is that when you're putting your synchronizer on top to measure your flow at idle, to make sure whichever one of these you want to use, I'm sure there's somebody who's got something different, you want to go to the to the forwardmost, closest throat to you on both sides of the car with the linkage disconnected on one side, and you want to tune these things and get them where both sides of the 
engine are running exactly the same. With a pair of these carburetors, you want everything starting off the same at the idle, okay? Now, where this bypass screw comes into play is if your throttle shaft is bent and these two aren't exactly the same. Then you can use this to get those exact, but it's barely perceptible by ear and you have to be pretty anal to do that and it's fun to play with and I know that you guys are going to want to experiment with it and open them and close them and do different things to them but the book calls out having these things completely closed if your carburetors are in good shape if they're sized right if your engines working right a lot of people accuse the carburetors as, as soon as they have that little stumble it's the carburetor it's the carburetor oh it's an HPMX that's a Chinese carburetor it's a piece of shit yeah yeah, everybody wants to blame it on this poor little instrument right here. Well, don't remember, don't forget, this is part of a system. If you can't get it out, you're not going to get it in. It depends on your camshaft. It depends on your spark. It became, depends on your uh, spark plug wires, your spark plugs, the exhaust system, the back pressure, everything will affect the tunability of your engine this is just this is the component that you can change so much and this is the this was the beauty if you went to a racetrack and they had a long straightaway and you were getting left everybody was passing you before the end of that straightaway in theory you could change that venturi size the big one inside comes out easy enough you could put a larger Venturi in there and that way you'd have more airflow capability and you could reach a higher top speed at the end of that straightaway. On the other hand, if you had a short track that was mostly turns and not very long straights, then you would want to put this back in there. And there, in fact, was the beauty of it. This was in the days of carburation. Fuel injection is so far superior in every way, shape, and form. This was back when it was up to the mechanic and it was up to the, 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 the crew at the track and the conditions for that day. That's, where, that's what separated the winners from the losers and, and made one guy stand out because he knew what to change and what to do. If you want to... If you want to lean the mixture, then you want to take that little air correction jet and you want to make it smaller because that's going to put less air into the well and more fuel and more fuel is going to be brought out. If you want to lean out the whole thing, then you would put a larger hole here, a larger air correction jet. It's not too much that you want to mess with this. Just think F11 when you're thinking uh, for a Volkswagen engine, okay? That, that's the best thing for, the, for us to do. Just leave that F11 tube in there. That's all you need to mess around with. Um, so, you got your main jet. You can richen it. You can make this one smaller. That'll richen it. You can raise your float level. That'll make it come in a little bit sooner. If your engine is idling, use your camera phone or something to do this. If your engine's idling, you can hold your camera and look down inside here, have a flashlight, and watch. If you've got constant fuel dribbling out of the side of this down inside there, maybe your float level's set too high. Or maybe the float valve in the float itself isn't shutting completely off and it's overfilling it. Maybe your fuel pressure is too high and this isn't capable of shutting that off. See how many variables there are there? This is why you really can't make a blanket statement and say for the best running car you want this and this and this and this. It comes with the start. It's going to start up and it's going to run. But if you have that hesitation right off of acceleration in the first place, 
you blipping the throttle from the back of the car is going to be different than when you're in the car driving the car. Uh, you'll get it set one way. Uh, if anything, the, the really, the true way to see that if you've got that progression circuit set up is to very, very slowly open the throttle and listen for that little stumble, that little transition, not jamming the throttle. I mean, if you had, in the 60s when I grew up, if you had a V8 and you jammed the throttle, uh, you know, it might rev okay when you got the hood up and the air cleaner off, but when you got in the car to go and drive in it and you floored it all of a sudden, it would fall flat on its face. And these are gonna do the same thing for crying out loud. Look how much air you're dumping in there. And you've got to get atomized fuel to catch up with that. And so keep that in mind as you're doing it. Now, another thing that I want to cover and that might come up is that if you're buying new carburetors, they only make right-hand carburetors. And this is a big thing. And I want, I've seen this time and time again. Guys want to add springs. These things won't come back to an idle. They don't return right. If you've got a shitty uh, throttle, I used to use a bus throttle wire. I know it has the I on it instead of the little S hook, but I'm talking like my off-road cars and stuff like that. I used the, the wire from a bus, uh, a stock throttle from a bus. It was a wire. It was stiffer, and it would push it and and we're going to go over here and we're going to look at my throttle you should also always have a wide open throttle stop generally as a rule in a car the throttle linkage that comes with this if you floor your car floor the pedal you'd be lucky if you have wide open throttle and some people think that you know just because it's not perfectly straightened up yeah it's good enough well the only reason why you don't feel a difference in fully straight up than slightly closed is that the rest of your system sucks. You don't have the heads to allow it to breathe, you don't have the exhaust, and you don't have the timing, and you don't have the valve springs to let them track the cam to get to the full potential. That's why it doesn't make any difference because you don't have a complete system you got a mismatch. It's got to work as a system. All those things have to work together. Okay, before I forget, they only make the right-hand carburetors. So they're taking this left-hand carburetor and the clock spring, I call this a clock spring because it winds around the shaft. These throttle bodies and these throttle shafts are on ball bearings, okay? They have ball bearings in them. They're not bushings that wear out like in a standard cheap Solex carburetor. They're ball bearings. So if you have a totally nasty carburetor like this and you're trying to clean it out, be careful about what you submerse these things into and for how long. You're probably better off with a sonic washer. But there's a seal on one side of those bearings. And just remember that that solvent is getting into those bearings and it's going to dry them out. They come with a little bit of lubrication on the factory. And, you know, it's just another reason why you're not saving shit when you go to a swap meet and buy used carburetors. Your linkage has got wear in it. You don't know what kind of drills have been through the jets. You probably need a master gasket rebuild kit. You probably need a new float valve. And... There's so many things you're 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 just keep raising the dollars, raising the dollars. Yeah, you can go home and put them on your car, and it'll start in the driveway and it runs, but it's going to be miserable to drive, and it's it's not going to be as much fun. And you're going to say, "Man, I'm glad I didn't spend eight hundred dollars on these things or six hundred. What about IDAs? IDAs are like thirteen hundred dollars now, and IDA carburetors are for racers. It's a different uh, it's a different carburetor, and there's just not Everything's not interchangeable. The principles and concepts are just the same as what we went over. Uh, but the, the absolute, probably the best car uh, out there is the D, uh, DOCE or the, the, the horizontal ones with the, with the jet uh, accessibility from right here, a separate little can away from the air cleaner. Man, I think those would just be the cat's meow, but they just don't work on a Volkswagen air-cooled engine. Now... I keep getting off, I keep finishing. They do make this kit. 
you want to take the spring off of this side and put it on this side because this is the side that your throttle linkage is going to come down to. It's going to be okay for the other side because as you can see the carburetor sits on this side and it comes with the clock spring on this side. It's important to have that clock spring because the clock spring in this configuration does not put any side pressure up and down on the bearing or the shaft. You're you have to if you have to adjust these bypass screws because they the they're not synchronized it's because the shaft is bent and guys will put all these darn springs and things on there either side they don't pay any attention to it if you've got return springs and you're always pushing it on this side and this spring is on the back side against the firewall you're you're putting a torsional twist on that throttle shaft. That throttle shaft is not meant for that. It's, it's, you really need to invest and get that spring off the back. It'll run that way. It'll run that way for a long time. But if you really want it to stay synchronized and be perfect, I'm telling you guys, uh, I just, oh, if you could drive one of my cars and see how that Gene Berg linkage works and the way I've got my cars tuned and set up, that is such a pleasure to drive. And, it, you know, they're still not as economical. Uh, of course, they are bigger engines, so a bigger displacement engine is not going to be as economical as a small one. All things being the same and not counting fuel injection. Fuel injection is... it. It does everything for you automatically, but it isn't without its fault. It does have complexity, and when it does crap out, um, available parts and stuff for these in the aftermarket on the air-cooled engine range, I know people will say, well, the factory came out with their, that damn factory fuel injection sucked as far as performance was concerned. Even on the stock engine, it was kind of like mediocre, and you'll know when they got that fuel injection, it was all about emissions. They were trying to get that car leaner. They even made the valve sizes smaller. That was the first time in the whole series. When, when they were making these other carburetors and they were going bigger in the carburetors, that wasn't the only thing they were doing. They, you'll know that in the 13, 15, and 1600 engines, they all used the same camshaft. That was the Goldilocks camshaft design as far as emissions and getting the engine to run and economy and durability and it would still get you just over 4,000 RPM consistently for years. But what did they do? When they went to enlarge the carburetor, they started changing the valve sides in the, in the head to allow it to breathe better, right? So you got to look at it again as as being a system so if you've got that bog you want to check everything else before you blame the carburetor you want to make sure that you got a good spark you got new spark plugs you've got good spark plug wires you got to measure the resistance on each individual spark plug wire I should probably make a video on that um, and maybe I will but I'm just trying to get through this I don't feel really well I think that antihistamine is actually working on my nose because it's, uh, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just you guys. Maybe I'm not going to die after all. Last night, oh man, I thought, oh no, I got it, I got it. My time is limited here. So, you know, enjoy this newfound knowledge with your car and your carburetors. Leave questions and comments down below. Uh, make use of your time. Try not to get the cabin fever. Try to get to know your, your spouse or your uh, girlfriend again and your kids. Uh, I saw the greatest little thing for a bumper sticker. It says something about, yeah, I saw the neighbor out there scraping the bumper sticker off her minivan that says, my child's an honor student because I guess that first week for homeschooling didn't go as well as she planned. <laughs> so she taking the sticker off. I know my grandkids, school's closed for the rest of the year. There there isn't gonna be any more school. And I really feel sorry for the sophomore or the seniors who aren't gonna have prom and prom dances and big graduation celebration and stuff like that. What a what a shame. This this is sure this just sure sucks, but I think it's bringing out the best in people and I think there's more 
you know good than there is evil and I hopefully we're gonna we're gonna get through this and we're gonna be uh, it's gonna work out for the best in the long run but history and the future is going to tell the story on that for sure. So this story is about over as far as this uh, this one on the carburetor. Now, I'm sure somebody's going to say, well, hell, this sucks. Why don't you put it on the car and let's hear it run? You shoot your mouth off. Well, you can see how shitty the inside of this carburetor was. And I did put them on the car after soaking these things and putting new gaskets and all that in there. I wasn't thoroughly thrilled with the way this setup worked and I wanted to try that single center mount setup and I bought at the swap meet you know I'm telling you guys don't man I had just been better off I would have been so much further ahead it probably would have worked out right from the get-go I bought a single center mount carbon manifold and it was this one right here and this is a 44 IDF now I saw that somebody put 32 Venturi's in here. I knew they were smaller than the 36 that usually comes in when you get the pair. And you need that to get the vacuum to work properly so the auxiliary Venturi's and the richness because you're all of a sudden you're asking a carburetor to do double duty here. You know, each barrel which was designed for port on port you're asking it to do double duty. Now I got to show you something right here in the book too. This this stuff is no mystery. There's you don't guess at it and you don't look at what's in a magazine. And the big problem with Volkswagen engines, if if you compare an American car, you go to a swap meet where the hoods are up or a, a car show where the hoods are up and you say, "Oh, there's a small block. Oh, there's a big block." I mean, it's so obvious by looking at them and they got different setups. But all of them look the same when you're looking at an air-cooled Volkswagen engine. You really don't get a visual difference between a 1300 and a 1600 or a 2276. It's still the physical dimensions are basically the same. And you see a set of 48 IDA carburetors sitting on your something, you say, wow, that is so cool. Well, A, you don't know if it's just for racing. Maybe it's just for show. Maybe the guy's got it and it runs like shit. You know, you know, you, you'll be lucky. You'll be lucky if you get 15 miles to the gallon running IDAs. What the what guys do that are smart is they put those 48 IDAs on. They come with 42 millimeter Venturi's. Yeah, 42s. They're huge, and they put the little the smallest Venturi's that you can purchase for it in there, jetted up accordingly, and they run around on the street that way. And then when they really do have something to prove or they want to race, then they change the setup and they put the big setup but the outside physical size isn't isn't changed that much and you know let's I didn't even touch anything about air cleaners the size of air cleaners okay pause the video and study this so it right here a 1600 would be that first mark if you go to the bottom of the shaded area that's what you want for economy and running around and it's calculated for that size of engine you're probably looking at a 24 millimeter venturi 25 millimeter venturi at the at the maximum right up here is you're looking at a 28 millimeter venturi right and that's what this carburetor comes with the IDF 40 carburetor comes with 28 millimeter venturis it doesn't mean it's not going to work on a, a 2110, right? I take my 36 Delordos and I move them from engine to engine and I don't have to change a thing. I don't have to do anything except calibrate that linkage. That linkage is critical and it deserves a video of its own. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that uh, at a later time. So um, here's another one. Now, this one is, is for racing and these are racing carburetors remember that's what we're talking about here single cylinder capacity and so you take the 1600 divided by four cylinders you get 400 cc's and you come up here and if you wanted to get 6000 rpm on it 
you'd come over here and you'd want like a 32 or maybe a 34 millimeter Venturi. It tells you right there. Pause it. Read it. You don't have to guess at it. It tells you right there. So, there, there, here's another one. Here's a different book. Single cylinder capacity. Select the size of your Venturi based on your performance objective. Put in larger Venturis to go fast. Stay with smaller or mid-sized Venturis for improved everyday driving. You don't have to figure anything out. There it is. The line is for a 1600 dual port. 400 cc's on one cylinder. So if you had a 2 liter, you'd go to the 5 right here. If you were only if you had a cam, there's no sense putting there's no sense putting a Venturi in there that's capable of doing 6 or 8,000 RPM when you got a cam and springs that's only going to do 5,000 like a damn wimpy ass Engel 110 cam. Yeah, that is a great cam, but it's only good for on its best day with the right heads and conditions, 6,000 RPM. So if you had a 2 liter and you wanted to go with uh, 6,000 RPM, what, what does it say here? You'd want to have like a 36 millimeter Venturi. I don't even know if they make them in that size, but that's where you get larger carburetors. And the Weber's were dominant carburetor in the 70s and that's what you're finding at the swap meets now most of them been sitting on shelves in garages for years either guys didn't get them set up right or the engines have long been gone or the engine blew up and somebody got the carburetors and it's more of an ornament it's a nostalgic thing carburetors are not the way to go Fuel injection, programmable fuel injection is superior in every way, shape, and form. And until, you know, even with turbocharging and supercharging. Now, we didn't even touch on that in this, but you have blow through turbochargers, and there's different things that we can do to these carburetors to make them work, and guys did make them work. The thing of it is, if something goes wrong during the process of operation and you go lean, or ignore the fact that you are going lean, um, you're going to tear up a very expensive engine. So right now what we're trying to do is enjoy our cars, make them last as long as they can, can, get good reliable performance out of them that's better than stock, but still have the same economy as stock. And I've done it and you can too. And it, it really, it's fun. There, it's, it's a light car. It's a very dangerous car to drive especially today remember that every other car a Honda Civic weighs more than your Volkswagen Beetle power to weight ratio is what makes us go as fast as we can you can make a Volkswagen Beetle go as fast as a uh, Honda Civic but it's never going to be as safe we don't have the structural integrity we don't have the airbags we don't have all of that sort of stuff and you start making these cars uh, real fast and start driving them carelessly on the street sooner or later uh, you're gonna have a problem driving a, a Volkswagen on the street is like uh, driving a full dress Harley basically and uh, I got this cool poster here I'm, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, putting these on the car and synchronizing them and we'll put the flow meters on it we'll do all that in another video it probably won't be to these carburetors I have bastardized uh, one of my 40 IDS to work on a single uh, setup and I've made videos on that in the past um, you can look in my uh, library I've got over 700 <laughs> videos up here here's some examples of crappy worn out shitty linkages um, and these are my 45 DeLordos, which were, one of them caught on fire and burned it up. And so I'm thinking about putting one of these update kits and throwing them on the car and seeing how things work out. So when we get to that point where we're putting those carbs on the this engine, this 2276, then we'll go over the linkage and the tuning and the synchronizing. And, and we'll, uh, about the only thing we'll be able to do with this lockdown is... Uh, drive around the block a little bit I suppose and uh, kind of get a sense of how they compare to these uh, 40 DeLordos that are on here right now so I hope you guys liked the video uh, I enjoy sharing with you uh, we're we're living in different times the world's never going to be the same again and it's only going to get better 
Thanks for watching. Thanks for subbing. Easy Jeezy, out. And if there is any outtakes, I might stick them on the end of this. So don't forget to give me a big thumbs up. Those thumbs up do matter for more reasons than one. And uh, if you're not subscribed, uh, don't forget to do that too. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Easy Jeezy Garage. We're going to continue our series on Weber carburetors. And this channel is all about building Volkswagen engines and running Volkswagen engines for with it. <laughs> hey, hey, you're out in the garage with the Easy Jeezy. Welcome back to my channel. At this channel, oh Christ, um, let's see. Hey, hey, welcome back to my channel. <laughs> yeah! Hey, hey, you're back in the garage with Easy Jeezy. This is rehearsal. I'm having a hell of a time getting started today. I don't know if I've got it, but I've got something going on. My head has just been stuffed up like you just can't believe it. I hope it's just allergies. Or uh, you may not get the end results of the Weber carburetor series. Man, I do apologize. But uh, if it is allergies, I have to stay inside and I got cabin fever as it is. So I'm going to go see my girlfriend and uh, bring her a burrito. I can't stand it anymore. So I'll turn you back on just a bit. Car feels good. <laughs> 